Most of us have watched at least one NASCAR race. Whether it be the big name tracks or the usual Sunday race where you can fall asleep and not miss a thing. But there's something I never strongly noticed before until recently. And that's the question in the title. Is NASCAR rigged? It's an intriguing and controversial statement, but it's an important question to address. Now I'm not saying it's every race or every event or that it's always been rigged. But for those of you that are skeptical already, let me explain the best I can. I read this book by Brian Tui called The Fix Is In, where he talks about the showbiz manipulations of the NFL, MLB, NBA, NHL, and NASCAR. The book primarily focuses on football, baseball, and basketball, but he has some cases about NASCAR that really made me think. I know that many of you will disagree with my statements and won't be happy with me, but that's okay. I cannot indisputably prove that NASCAR is rigged but I can offer a case that leans in that direction. All I ask is that you listen and not be naive, because one must learn alternate perspectives to be well informed, and then one can come to conclusions through understanding instead of ignorance. So whether you agree or not, at least listen. The information may shock and fascinate you. After reading Tui's book, I started the 2013 NASCAR season with a new perspective. I stopped looking at sports as sports and instead looked at it as a business, and I was watching like a hawk for any possible evidence of manipulation. And here's what I found. Have you ever noticed that there is often a caution in the last few laps of a race to make things more interesting and exciting due to some random piece of debris on the track? Debris on the racetrack. Debris in turn four. I'm glad NASCAR didn't step in and throw a bunch of BS debris cautions all day long to try to, you know, make a show out of it. Because of kind of a caution to put a show on for the fans. I mean, that's a good part of this sport is we gotta keep the fans excited. and the inconsistency of yellow flags. If it's the last lap of a green-white checkered, the officials often don't wave the flag, either because a fan favorite is winning. There they go. And Burton goes around. A lot Coffee of smoke. Heads. They had a little bit of a rag back here, no caution. Keselowski got bounced around, but we are still green. Or they want an exciting finish to please the fans. You lead at the white. That's it. You're good to go, but they may no race caution. to the finish. Yes, they're yep. gonna let them race back here. That happened over in turn two, so they got plenty of room. Oh, wow. right, let them race, boys. Hopefully. Basically, whatever it takes to make the race more exciting. Now, it's important to stress that NASCAR is family-owned, and it's not illegal for NASCAR to fix its own races, because they can do what they want with NASCAR. They own it. The Daytona 500 is also owned by NASCAR, which may explain why there are such obscurities at that track in particular. Remember a few years ago when Dale Jr. won at Daytona in the Nationwide Series while driving the number three car in the old paint scheme? How could they not let him win? And no driver would want to beat him. The fans would rip them to shreds. How about the 2013 Daytona 500? Did anyone else raise an eyebrow when Danica Patrick got the pole? She races terribly if she even finishes the race, and now she gets the pole at Daytona? Are you kidding me? You know why NASCAR allowed her to get the pole, right? Here's where you must think business. The Daytona 500 is the biggest race in NASCAR, right? And by having a woman in the pole position gives women across the world better reason to watch the race too. But over the past several years, NASCAR says it's seen more women in the driver's seat. Yeah, it's seen more female fans too cheering them on. Attracting more women in racing is something NASCAR has embraced. A 60% male and 40% female fan base. Certainly a young lady by the name of Danica Patrick has been a, a boost over the last couple of years as well. Marketing at its finest. And that's the key word here. Marketing. NASCAR is all about money and sponsors. I know you all already know this, but NASCAR is a monotony of constant advertising. Drive in hunger, DuPont, Pepsi, Quaker State, Chevrolet. You can't go two seconds without there being an ad for something on the screen. And that's not during the commercial breaks. Tui calls NASCAR a mass marketing cesspool. And I'm sure most of you would agree with that. And that's why whole teams don't get suspended, because a team suspension would also be a suspension of their valued sponsors. It's usually just the crew chief, and rarely it's the driver, mainly because many fans may not watch the race if their favorite driver isn't competing. Basically, when corporations with sponsors and TV stations are involved, there is huge potential for race fixing. Here are some of Tui's examples. He addresses the Pepsi 400 in 2004, 
where Pepsi had a promotion of offering Pepsi Edge to everyone in America if Jeff Gordon, who was Pepsi sponsored, won the race. And lo and behold, he wins. Jeff Gordon's DuPont Pepsi Chevy is going to win the Pepsi 400 free Pepsi Edge for America. And it was his first Daytona win since 1999. Five years. His first at Daytona since 1999. What a big day for Pepsi, man. Uh, we had a bunch of uh, those red cars for some reason. I don't know what they were, but they were uh, in my way. So uh, it was pretty awesome to fish ahead of them. Uh. This win could have been a coincidence, but let's keep going. What about the 1979 Daytona 500? The first race to be fully broadcast on national television with a new CBS contract. The 21st annual Daytona 500 here on CBS today. I'm guessing CBS was really happy with the good ratings because of that exciting finish, and that probably convinced them to keep broadcasting more races. What about the 1984 Firecracker 400 with Petty's 200th win against Cale Yarborough, with President Ronald Reagan in attendance too? Do I even need to explain it any further? Up there with the President of the United States on July the 4th, uh, win your 200th race. And it's not always Daytona either. What about Jimmy Johnson's Lowe's car being so successful at Lowe's Motor Speedway back when it had that name? Look at how successful he was. But once Lowe's stopped sponsoring that race, he hasn't won there since, and has sometimes done very poorly. Even more recently, did anyone notice that Carl Edwards won the Subway Fresh Fit 500 at Phoenix while being sponsored by Subway? Makes you think, doesn't it? Tui states that these riggings have a purpose. Perhaps an old champion needs a win, or the fans need satisfaction and a good story. After Earnhardt's tragic death, NASCAR was hit hard concerning driver safety, so that event basically ruined the race and did not benefit the series. But the story they created surrounding Earnhardt's death did. Yeah, you know where I'm going with this. Steve Park wins the next race. Harvick a couple weeks later in an exciting finish against Earnhardt's rival. But then there's the first race back at Daytona, and Junior seems to race far too well. Can Dale Junior win this race? Yes. How is he passing these cars without any help? Passing on the restrictor plate racetracks is a tough thing to do. You realize this is a restrictor plate track, right? Did they take off his restrictor plates for this particular race? When you think about it, car tampering is not that complex. The team can easily make one car faster than others with no difference to the untrained eye. Anyway, he ends up winning, resulting in a storybook ending and warm feeling in fans. Or severe skepticism. Tui even quotes Waltrip saying that I wasn't going to pass him for nothing. If that's not enough to make you think, then how about the fact that NASCAR just signed a $2.8 billion deal with NBC? And the Pepsi 400 just so happened to be the first race on NBC's NASCAR schedule. See the connections? What a way to open a new television deal, eh? And it was the highest rated primetime race in NASCAR's history. So don't tell me there wasn't manipulation when it profited NASCAR and the TV stations that much. When new TV stations are ever involved in pro sports, watch the big games extra close because the sport is going to want an exciting finish to please the new station. I must address the obvious rebuttal that you can't get every driver and crew member to agree to a fix. And I agree. The small name teams are not going to agree to a fix. Why would they? But here's the thing. They don't have to know, because their chances of winning are far too slim. All you need is the big name owners to agree, like Hendrick, Gibbs, Roush, Penske, and have them notice that a certain race result would benefit everyone. You don't need a whole bunch of people to agree just the few in control. I already addressed how some wouldn't watch the chase if their favorite driver was not competing. So with that in mind, I'm going to discuss the Boyer incident at Richmond. So Boyer, quote, intentionally spun out to give Truex a chance of making the chase. Okay, what's wrong with that? It's called strategy. Let them do it if it works for the team. Anyway, he gets in trouble for it and the whole standings gets shuffled. But it's the 13th driver that concerns me. I was watching the race with my father and I told him that NASCAR wanted Gordon in because he's a popular driver and many probably wouldn't watch the chase if he wasn't in it. Anyway, NASCAR comes out and says that Gordon's in as the 13th car and I just shook my head. It's moments like this that gives NASCAR the ability to literally change the rules where they see fit and to kick some drivers out and let the popular money-making drivers in because they claim some team cheated. And they just feel like that they manipulated the finishing order of the race. 
I'm not strongly advocating that NASCAR did this rule changing at Richmond, but who says NASCAR can't just mess with the rules whenever they want? In the future, NASCAR could claim some driver cheated and make the standings however they please. The way I see it, NASCAR won't allow rigging that's not in their control. And now Boyer's covering the NASCAR media and we are to focus on him as a cheater instead of the bigger picture of the whole organization. Anyhow, that's my rant. I could go on about odd things in NASCAR or talk about football and baseball rigging, but really the point of this video is to get people thinking. If NASCAR has the potential to be fixed, why not other pro sports? We already know about the fixed soccer matches in Europe. But who's to say it goes beyond just soccer, or Europe for that matter? If corporate interests are not involved, then there is a simple answer to fixed games, guaranteed losses, and bad ref calls. Gambling. Gambling is huge in the sports industry, and once players and refs start betting on their own games, that's where fixes come in. But that is a whole separate discussion. I hope those of you watching gained something important through this presentation, and I want you all to leave with this. Don't be naive and stop thinking of professional sports as sports, but as a business. Thank you.